We are recording today's session and we will be sending this out to everybody. Um, hopefully tomorrow, we'll see how long it takes for Zoom to actually process the, the video uh, and we will send that out to you. We will also send out to you the slides from Marianne and her supplemental notes. Um, and then we will also have a feedback survey about how you felt today went. This is our first time doing a Zoom webinar, so any feedback would be greatly appreciated. And we'll have an additional survey about what other types of PD sessions you'd be interested in um, participating in. So that's just a few items. And so I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tara to introduce our speaker today. And Tara, I think I've just turned on. I'm having difficulty. Tara, can you turn on your, there you go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, and welcome. We're very excited uh, to have Marianne here tonight. I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction uh, about our wonderful presenter. So uh, Marianne McTro was born and raised in Southern Alberta, where she earned her uh, BFA at the University of Lethbridge in 1998. In 2001, she received her MFA in studio art from Concordia University in Montreal. And from 2006 to 2017, McTro collaborated with Daniel Wong as the folk art alternative performance duo, the Cedar Tavern Singers or also known as Le Phono Release. Sorry, I hope I didn't mess that up, Marianne. And she uh, presently works at the University of Lethbridge Art Department as a technician since uh, 2011. And on a personal note, I just wanna say Marianne contributes so much to the Allied Arts Council. She's always willing to participate uh, in events and uh, we really appreciate uh, her being here tonight. So uh, I will now turn it over to Marianne McTrow for her presentation. Okay, thanks Tara. Um, and everyone, there's an example of a bio, which I'll talk about <laughs> later in the presentation. Um, yeah, thanks to the Allied Arts Council for, for having me and thanks for everybody um, turning up. Uh, let me see about this screen sharing thing that I've got going on, and there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, some basics of putting together uh, an art proposal, whether that's for a grant or for um, an art gallery. So looking at calls for submissions and exhibition proposals. So I'm going to briefly talk about uh, different kinds of galleries that are out there, where to find the information, what to consider before you start your application process, uh, what you need to include in an application, um, including the do's and do not do's. Uh, the do not do's are just as important as the do's. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about the grant application. So for kinds of galleries, um, start with the vanity gallery or the pop-up gallery. And this is the DIY gallery. So it's, it's all you, you produce the, um, the invitations, you do all the PR, uh, you do the lighting, the installation, you buy the food for the opening. If there's an opening, everything is yours. So this would be, for example, if you were to, um, find an empty um, storefront downtown or something in in your own house you could do but it's all you so there's no jury involved and there's no application uh, process involved and this is is kind of a good way of, um, of building community uh, of course it's going to be um, it's not going to be a money maker for you necessarily you could sell your work um, but it's, it's a good thing to, to get started. Um, Artist-run centers have been around in Canada since the 1960s. They are nonprofit institutions and they run on um, uh, grants, uh, local, regional and national grants, and as well as their own fundraising. Um, often membership fees will contribute to um, how they're able to run. They will have particular focuses. So for example, uh, La Centrale in Montreal shows mainly work 
by um, how uh, women identified people. And artist-run centers will also have um, a lot of times satellite spaces. So for example, the plus 15 spaces um, in Calgary truck has, a, has its main space and it has a plus 15 space. Uh, Stride, same thing. Um, and artist-run centers may also uh, do something somewhat like the Vanity Gallery where, where they will find um, uh, empty storefronts or uh, for festivals or performances, uh, spaces that are outside of their main space. Um, Artist-run centers can also have a focus on emerging artists for some of their calls for submissions, um, or they may have themed calls. Generally, their deadlines are once or twice a year, and um, they will sometimes do uh, special projects. Community centers like the gallery at CASA will have a curator, um, they'll do juried exhibitions or they will uh, solicit submissions for either theme submission um, or group um, uh, shows or you can apply for a solo show. And so going to these centers websites, you'll be able to see what their deadlines are what the process is and uh, what they look for and how they do the jurying. Public galleries and museums are also, at least in Canada, usually nonprofit. Uh, they will usually have a curator and they sometimes will manage a collection. Rather than public calls, they are programmed through um, curation. So sometimes they will have a public call for a thematic group show or for a special event, but generally it's the curator who does the programming and the curator will often do that programming through studio visits. So rather than um, artists sending packages to the public gallery or museum, the uh, curator will hear about their work or be doing some traveling and the curator will come to the artist and do a studio visit. And then we have commercial galleries. So these are for profit. They don't usually pay for the show. So for example, with the artist run centers, they will pay uh, the artist an artist fee. Um, if the artist is installing their own work, if the work is something that takes um, in particular the artist to install it, as opposed to just hanging paintings, it's something um, more complex, they may pay an installation fee. They will usually, uh, if, if you're going to another city, they will pay for your hotel. They may give you a per diem so that you're not going out of pocket for um, your meals during the day. With commercial gallery, they don't cover any of that usually. Uh, the revenue comes from sales. So for the most part, when you're represented by a commercial gallery, the cut is 50-50. And theoretically, they will do all the work. So with a vanity gallery, you are um, installing the work, cleaning up the space, um, producing the invitations, producing the opening and everything, but the commercial gallery, they are doing all of that for you. And that is generally why they're taking 50% uh, um, on the sale of your work. And they also may be storing your work as well. So where can you find information about calls for submission? Or, um, or galleries, check their websites and uh, their online notice boards. Sign up for e-newsletters and mailing lists. Um, a lot of galleries also have Facebook pages and if you join, then you automatically get invitations to, uh, to what's going on. And uh, a lot of galleries will also set up um, an event for a deadline that's coming up. So that's how they'll, they'll advertise. Um, and then joining local, provincial, and national organizations. So I'm sure many of you who are in attendance are members of the Allied Arts Council. 
and that may be how you found about uh, found out about today's talk and it's a good idea to find out about local um, organizations whether they are arts councils or community organizations or artist organizations um, that will often share information amongst one another um, the allied arts council newsletter has a really great section of calls for submissions that are split up into um, different different sections so you can quickly scan through and see what uh, what applies to you so here is a list of um, um, things that that i usually go to on a regular basis or i have subscribed to or or am a member of so carfac is the um basically the union the canadian art union um, the Alberta um, segment of it, their website is carfacalberta.com, and I am just going to um, move to their website here. So here's the Carfac Alberta website. Um, you can visit to join to see what they offer. They have um, a member shop. They will often have uh, calls for submissions that you can um, can submit to. They've got a lot of professional development stuff that they do. Um, and one of the important things, I think I mentioned with the artist-run centers, the paying of uh, CARFAC fees. And the CARFAC fee schedule is the schedule that has been set by this artist union um, that lays out what is a fair amount of money that an artist should expect to be paid depending on uh, where they're showing, uh, the type of show that it is, whether it's a festival or a performance, a group show or a solo show. Um, and so this is a really important um, aspect of, of what CARFAC does. Now, everything that's on the website here, you don't have to be a member to have a look at it and a lot of the links lead to um, to more stuff that you don't necessarily need to be a member for but when you do join um, let's see I've got to, here we go when you do join here is a list of things that they um, that they do and the services that they have so they advocate they educate they innovate and they have all of these great services. Um, so for example, if you have questions about copyright, you can consult Carfac about that. Um, they have a certificate of origin. If you're traveling abroad or outside of the country with art, um, they will help you with this certificate so you are not paying fees to bring your own art back into the country. Um, they have advisory notes. Um, they're on social media, they have a newsletter and you can share your website and you can share um, a network through that. So I've been a member of, of Visual Arts Alberta Carfax for quite a few years and it really is, it really is worth it. I would, I would definitely um, recommend that. Um, the Alberta Foundations for the Arts is our provincial art granting agency. Canada Council is the national granting agency. Uh, you all know about artsleftbridge.org, another great um, uh, institution. Instantcoffee.org is, um, is a group, uh, they put out a newsletter kind of irregularly but they try to gather information from across Canada about calls for submission, um, exhibitions that are coming up, residencies, things like that and, and it is free to join and it is also free to uh, submit to these lists as well. Akimbo is through um, Toronto and it's pretty Ontario specific um, I, I was uh, subscribed to Akimbo for a while, but um, got tired of, of all the Toronto information. Uh, Akimbo is a little different because I believe in order to submit, you do have to pay a fee. 
um, but they do have lots of calls for submissions for galleries. Uh, our deadlineslist.com is another one. Resartist.org is international art residencies. So um, it's a great website to check every once in a while or to subscribe to their newsletter. Uh, this is Res Artists is how I found out about um, a residency at the Textile Center in Iceland, which I participated in um, in 2017. And when you go to the website, you can search um, all kinds of different ways. You can search by discipline, you can search by country, um, you can search by whether residencies are free or if they um, if they charge for you to attend. Uh, so for example, there was one I found in, I think it was in Finland. It was on an archipelago and it was, it was free basically. Um, you had to get yourself there and you had to pay a very nominal fee um, for heat and electricity while you, while you were there, but your use of the studio and the place you were staying were essentially um, given to you for free. So resartist.org is, is a really great, um, great place to start if you want to have a look at what kind of artist residencies are, are out there. And then finally, this directory of artist-run centers and collectives. It used to be published as a book, but they stopped publishing and went online. And I'm just going to visit them now. So the directory of artist-run centers and collectives here. So um, in 2014 is when they started to replace the print version, um, which had up till then been published every four years. And again, it's a really great way to get to know the artist-run centers and collectives in Canada and, and see what may be um, appropriate for you to apply to, to look at what all the deadlines are, what their mandates are. Um, you can search any discipline here, whether you're uh, working in architecture through visual arts. Um, so you can really kind of drill down and see, maybe you just wanna to stick to searching in Alberta and you can do your search and, and find all that that way. So this website, I would, I would really recommend visiting if you're looking for, um, some some places in Canada artist run centers to apply to and again they do um, for the most part pay the Carfax fees um, and it's really important if you are an artist who is trying to actually make a living by making art it is important that you get paid for your work and um, you'll see through some of the the newsletters and online submissions that some galleries charge for a submission. They'll charge a certain fee per um, image that you submit or a flat fee for applying. And I, I will never um, pay to apply because uh, it's just always such a crapshoot. Um, I, I just, I'm not gonna put any more money into it uh, than, <laughs> than I already am. Oh boy. All right, let's go back to PowerPoint. And, and as Don said, the, the PowerPoint's gonna be available to you. And um, in my supplemental information, I go into a little bit more detail with this list here. So what to consider before applying? Uh, does my work fit their mandate? So always make sure that you check out the mandate of the gallery, their reason for existing, the type of work that they, um, that they show. What are they asking for in terms of um, an artist? Do they focus mainly on emerging artists? Do they focus mainly on um, women identifying artists? Or maybe they are looking for a particular type of work, or maybe they're a gallery that deals only with a type of, uh, particular type of, um, of material, so painting. So if you were a sculpture, then uh, you wouldn't want to uh, even bother. So always check out what the mandate is. And they're always gonna be um, different from one another. What exactly 
are they looking for? Um, you'll see this in the call for submission. They, they are usually pretty specific about what they're looking for. Will you propose already existing work or new work? So if you're proposing work that already exists, then presumably you've had time to, to think about and maybe write about that work. Maybe you've already written um, an artist statement or a submission, and then it's just a case of, of tailoring it to that, um, that call. Or are you proposing new work? So work that either you um, haven't had a chance to necessarily think about and write about, or work that you are, uh, that you haven't made yet, that you're thinking about making for this particular call. So that, that will take a little bit more work on your part in terms of being able to um, write about work that doesn't exist yet. Do you already have a package that you could tailor to fit the call? So that goes along with proposing work that maybe already exists. Um, so it's a good idea when you're starting to write um, and put together a package to keep that and have a look at, um, at other deadlines and other artist-run centers for, for which your work may be appropriate. And then why not do up a package and then do make those minor alterations so that you can send that package out to two or three or five different galleries across Canada. And um, maybe one of them will, will bite. Um, maybe they all will and you'll have a touring show. And then last but most important question is when is the deadline and do I have time to put a good proposal together? So I've, I've had the experience of, um, pardon me, coming across a deadline, um, a call for submission that seems perfect, I've got the work or it's work that I've been thinking of making and I see the deadline is in a week and I just, delete that information from my brain because there's no point. I know I don't have time to get a good application together in a week. Um, I'll just see if, uh, I'll, look, I'll look harder next time. So definitely, if you don't have time to put together a solid proposal, then um, don't, don't start. I mean, you might start putting something together in um, anticipation of then tailoring a package and sending it out but if you don't have time then um, you don't want to put yourself through the stress or submit a bad application that then leaves the jury with a with a bad impression of you because jury jury members uh, will often serve on multiple juries and maybe they'll remember you and uh, associate your name with uh, with a poorly put together package. So this package, what goes in it? Um, only put what the gallery asks for. So um, if they are not asking for a biography, there's no need to include one. Um, if they are not asking for an image list that includes descriptions of the work, then there's no need to include that. Um, if there's any confusion, if you, if you read the application, the call for submissions, and you're not sure what they're asking for, or it's not completely clear, you can always contact them and and ask for that uh, that information you can either call somebody or you can email um, I know for sure with with the Canada Council and with the Alberta Foundation for the Arts any questions with um, the granting application process they are happy to answer those questions because they really want artists to succeed follow the formatting requirements exactly so if they ask you for a, um, a CV that is no more than two pages, don't include a three to four page CV. Whittle it down to two pages. Um, if they only ask for an artist statement to be 250 words, stay below the word limit. 
Uh, they may even ask you to submit in the form of a PDF with the images included in that PDF document as opposed to attached separately as JPEG. So make sure that you do that. Um, they may also ask you to label your images in a very particular way. Um, last name, uh, title, year, or maybe you can just last name and a number, but do be sure that you are um, following those, those format requirements. You will want to include in the package a cover letter. So what you want to do, and, and this is even, this is the email that you would send with your package attached to it. So you want to briefly address, uh, pardon me, spending a lot more time with my cat these days. Um, and unfortunately, I'm allergic to the cat. So address the committee, the jury, or the curator briefly, uh, dear so-and-so. Make a note of the program or the call to which you are submitting. Sometimes galleries will have more than one call out at the same time, so you want to make sure that you, you say which one you are submitting to. Uh, briefly summarize what your package contains. Um, please find attached a list of these things, and then if you have forgotten to attach something, they'll say, well, no, actually you haven't. And then include your contact information. So include um, if there's uh, a phone number that you can be reached at um, in case they do have any questions. Uh, make sure that you're, um, you're ad identifying that for them. You'll want to include an artist statement or a project description. Now this, um, this is what a lot of people have trouble with. Um, excuse me, I, I don't enjoy writing artist statements myself. I find them really, I don't like them. I don't like writing them. But once I've got one, um, if I'm making work in that same kind of vein, I will go back to that artist statement and I'll kind of tailor it to each project. Or if I find that I am um, working in a particular way in a larger body of work, then I will use that to, to frame the work that I'm, that I'm talking about. Now your artist statement should relate to and support the visual documentation included in the package. So um, you want what they're reading to talk to what they're going to see and what they see, then they can relate that back to the artist statement. So if you're talking about a particular work, you want to show examples of that particular work. The artist statement should make the work clear in the mind of the reader. So both in terms of um, the concept and materially what the work looks like. So in the mind of the reader, they can visualize what, what this is. Um, now with grant applications, the jury will sometimes receive the written material before they see the documentation. So you need your written material to be clear enough um, and accurate enough that when they read it, what they imagine, they're not surprised by what they see. They see your documentation and, ah, oh, yes, that's, that's what it is. Uh, now, depending on the package requirements or the focus needed, you may want the statement to highlight a single direction or specific work, especially important if submitting to a themed exhibition. So you may want to be more or less specific depending on what the gallery is asking for. If it's a themed call for submission, you want to choose a work that fits that theme and you want to talk about how that work fits that theme and you want to probably even um, quote part of the um, of the call for submissions back if you feel like your work really really fits that theme um, you may you may want to highlight that uh, 
you should have someone read over your written material before you submit it, or at the very least read it to yourself out loud to catch any obvious errors. Um, reading something out loud is kind of the easiest way to see where you may have accidentally um, gone on too long with your sentence or had some kind of weird sentence fragment or if you uh, started a thought and then you jumped to a different part of the statement and you forgot to go back, uh, back to it, it's really important that your written material is is cohesive and, and um, able to be understood. So if someone else reads it for you or you read it out loud, um, that'll, that'll be a big help. Um, I know an artist from Saskatchewan who uh, he has admitted, and I have witnessed this, that he's a terrible writer. Um, he sent me an, an email a couple of times and I was just like, I don't, this is, this is not written very well. But his wife is, is a good writer. So what he will do is when he's putting together a proposal or a grant application, he'll write down um, all his ideas, he'll write out his statement, hand it over to his wife, and then his wife goes through it with a red pen and makes all the corrections and then gives it back to him. And then the result is something much more um, coherent and cohesive than he would have uh, come up with by himself. And writing is, is a skill um, that not everybody is, is great at it. And um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be a really awesome writer in order to get your work seen. But unfortunately, you, you do have to have some skill in order to communicate um, about your work at at least this level of, of submitting to a call for, um, for proposals. And there is nothing wrong with um, getting other people to help you with that. Uh, you are the artist and so you know your work the best, um, but you may need help talking about it in a clear way. And, and so there's nothing wrong with, uh, with getting help. For that. Um, so uh, ask someone you know or consider employing a copy editor. Uh, and here's where I plug Kim Seaver, who runs Hot Pepper Communications here in Lethbridge. Um, and his website is there, www.hotpepper.ca. And he, he does editing for, uh, for a living. So um, you can ask him what his rates are, and he's done editing for all kinds of, of different uh, types of writing. The CV. Oh, you know what? Before we go to a CV, I'm just going to cut to an example of an artist statement, a short one from 2015. Um, I can't see any of your faces, so I won't know if you are imagining what what this actually is, but this was a statement for a short video piece that I, that I had in Calgary a few years ago called, What Do You Call? And I said of it, What Do You Call is simply a reading of a bunch of What Do You Call and What Do You Get jokes. The video footage is edited so that each of the jokes has been separated. The setup questions come first, one after the other, followed by each of the punchlines. The questions follow one another in quick su succession and there is little time for the viewer to guess what the punchline might be before the next setup is presented. The punchlines are delivered next, again providing the viewer little time to recall the beginning of each joke and subjecting them to what amounts to a list of mostly one word puns with no context. They are still pretty funny though. Are they? Let's go back. So a CV, um, the CV is basically your resume. So it goes through all of your relevant experiences um, as an artist. It's not a narrative, it's not written in paragraph form, it's much like, um, like a resume for a job. Write it in factual, straightforward style. 
don't use windings or um, as much as you might like the litter box font, don't use it. Uh, you want it to be easy to read. Um, it's not the place to share everything you've ever done or to get into your personal life. Again, look back at the mandate of the art gallery or the, um, the requirements for the submission. And you can tailor your CV to that. Um, it should only include information relevant to your professional training and experience as an artist. So you may have had a job that somehow relates to your artistic practice, but unless it's something that is really actually relevant, there's no need to, uh, to include it. And it's really important to keep it up to date. So what I do is um, I keep a kind of a master CV on my computer and anytime I have any sort of a show or a performance or if there's an article or uh, if I give a talk it'll go on that CV and then when I'm submitting a CV to a gallery or um, for whatever reason I take that master list and I pare it down so it's just the relevant stuff and it just fits into what they're asking for and often a gallery will ask for a CV to be no more than two pages long. So you do have to decide what is, what is the most important and you may not even be able to include your earliest stuff. So my master CV does include all of the shows that I was involved in as an undergraduate student, but when I am sending a CV to a gallery, I don't include that information. So the information will always appear in chronological order with the most recent information first in each category and include any upcoming information as well. So under the heading of um, solo exhibitions, you might start with upcoming solo exhibitions. Um, and then your name and the page number should appear at the top of each page after the first in case uh, your CV does get printed out for packages, um, or if the jurors receive them by computer and they decide to print them out themselves, if your package gets dropped, your CV is identifiable as yours because it has your name at the top and they can put the pages in order because the pages are numbered. So here is um, basically what your CV looks like. Um, at the top is your name. Now date and place of birth are, are optional. I have the date of birth on mine, um, but you may feel more or less comfortable including that and it may be more or less relevant. Um, for example, if, if a gallery is looking for artists under 30, if you put your date of birth, then that proves you're under 30. Uh, your mailing address phone and email, any um, art-related education that you've received, oops, residencies that you have um, participated in, awards including grants, exhibitions, screenings if you've been involved in screenings, performances, uh, collaborations if this is a big part of your work, bibliography to include um, anything that's been written about your work. Uh, I always include the title of, of a review from a show that um, my husband Dave was in, and the title of that was Time Takes Its Artistic Toll in Intolerable Exhibits. What a title for a review. And then your related experience or other experience um, for an art gallery application, maybe not as relevant, but if you are applying for grad school or if the application asks for it, then this is where you might put um, lectures, talks, curatorial work, stuff like that. And then finally, collections, which is your list of uh, corporate or public agencies that have bought your work. And you can include the phrase, private collections in Canada and the USA or wherever to cover any work that's owned by um, 
friends and relatives. So the stuff that's on your mom's fridge can go under that private collections um, heading. Um, next, you're going to have some images and some other support material with a corresponding information list. Uh, again, they're going to tell you how many images to include, how to format those images, um, how to uh, format the list of information as well. They're going to ask you for your proposal or your statement of intent. So what you if if you're submitting a proposal for um for a solo show you want to describe the entire thing if you're submitting a proposal for a group exhibition and you're just submitting one or two works then your proposal is going to include what that particular work is so it's like the artist statement but it addresses the particular work you're putting forward so the artist statement um, can be quite general and we'll talk about your, um, your larger body of work, the sort of themes that you deal with um, generally, maybe no matter what the particular work it is, it always has something to do with the passage of time, for example, or uh, the experience of the body. But then your proposal or statement of intent much more specifically talks about the particular work. Sometimes you will be asked to include a budget. So you'll need to know um, uh, if you're producing work at the gallery, what kinds of things you're going to need the gallery to include. An equipment list. So if you're uh, doing media based work and you need um, a data projector or data projectors or um, flash drives or monitors or any of that kind of thing, they will ask for that. Support materials like reviews or publications. Uh, so I believe with grant applications, you can send in these types of support materials and then possibly a short biography. So with the biography, it's um, not, it's kind of like your life story very briefly plus um, the history of your art practice, which is a really hard thing to write kind of, but once you get the hang of it, it's not so bad. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pull up a sample bio. Oh, here's a sample CV. I'm just going to whiz through it so you can see what, what it looks like. So when you are paring down your CV, these are not all the awards, because of course I've been awarded so many of them. Uh, these are selected awards. Um, same with selected solo and two-person exhibitions to say, well, there are more, but here are the ones I think are the most re relevant. Uh, biography. So you may be asked to write, I think the shortest biography I was asked, asked to submit was something like 50 words, which um, like it was really challenging to, um, to write that. But you just want to get down to the absolute basic. And mine is uh, where I was born and raised in Southern Alberta, Yahoo, uh, where I got my education, the fact that my work is all over the place and um, what I think I mostly focus on in the broadest and most vague sense. Um, but you can, like I would, I would suggest going online and, and visiting artists' websites and seeing how different people format their biographies. And really, you just are kind of introducing yourself. What are they looking for? What are they looking for? So um, they, they will want to know what, what is the work? What is the work that you are, um, that you're putting forward? What is the topic that you're addressing? What is new and exciting 
in your work in particular that is different from um, the other work that they're seeing? Uh, how is it made uh, materially? How does it look aesthetically? How is it finished? Has it been exhibited before and how has it been exhibited? Um, does the artist demonstrate that they can complete the work or do what you are proposing? So your CV is a record of your success and it is the proof that when you say you can do a particular thing, that you can do that particular thing. Um, the documentation also shows this. If you are um, proposing uh, a mural that is 30 feet by 80 feet and in your documentation you show that you've done that sort of thing before, then they know that you, you can complete it. Uh, what, is, what is the strength of your past work? How do you connect to the gallery's mandate or the gallery's goals? Uh, what will the gallery's um, audience gain from, from your work? How does your work relate to past programming? So when you visit the gallery's website, have a look not only at the mandate, but what they have shown um, in the past, because you can see uh, if you don't like any of the work that they usually show, then they're probably not the gallery for you. Um, is there a local connection? So some gallery mandates will be to show uh, local artists. So maybe you have a connection there that, that makes you appropriate. Um, curators also have particular particular areas of research. Um, some curators may be absolutely uninterested in uh, landscape painting. So there is no point as a landscape painter um, approaching this curator because they're just not going to be interested. Practicalities. So for example, the budget. The gallery may or may not be able to afford to supply you with all the equipment that you need. So you need to, um, uh, to think about that when you're making that application. Uh, the location of it. Do you have to travel far? Are they going to have to ship a lot of work? Or can you just carry um, your work on a flash drive with you in your pocket? Um, other areas in terms of practicalities, are you proposing something that is um, possible or impossible? So you want to kind of strike a balance if you're proposing work that you haven't done before between proposing something that sounds really awesome and that you've always wanted to do, but you don't want to propose something that is like completely completely um, pie in the sky, uh, unlimited budget type of thing. So you want to think about, about practicalities. Uh, last is to look at um, grant applications and how they maybe um, differ from, from juried things. So the money that's available, as I'm sure you all know, is a lot less than the money that is requested. Um, so not everybody gets a grant and that's okay. Um, even if you are judged worthy, you may not get the grant. Maybe they only have enough money to offer to the top 10 artists and projects and you came in at 11 or, and you just, it was like the jurors had to have a a leg wrestle to decide between 10 and 11. Um, so don't be, don't be discouraged. It's just not, um, it's not going to happen for everybody. Uh, it's also, it's not a prize for the best work that is submitted. Uh, your ability as an artist is a really important factor but it's viewed more in terms of it being an example of your ability to date 
And so the jury is looking at your ability to date, what you have done to date, and how is it related to the proposed project for which the grant is being requested? How much of an impact is the grant going to make on your practice, on moving your practice forward? Um, is the work impactful, not just for you who is creating it, but for the larger community? Um, grants, granting juries are made up of, of your peers, so they're always other practicing artists. And no jury is the same. So you might uh, send a proposal to the AFA for a particular deadline and it gets rejected and then you resubmit it for the next deadline and it gets accepted. And it's not because suddenly magically it was a better application, it's just that the jury has changed. Um, there's also the fact that uh, because there's not enough money, you may get a letter saying sorry, but then someone else has to turn down a grant or they end up getting more money than they expected. And then you get a call later that says, well, actually, if you still want to make that thing, uh, we can give you the money. And that has happened to me um, in the past that I was turned down for a grant. And then a few months later, I had not produced the work because I didn't get the grant, but I got a call from the AFA and they said, hey, you got great news. Um, are you still able to do that project? And I was. So ability without intent is not justification for the grant, but if you have a really good idea, but no evidence to back up that you can actually follow through, then you're not gonna be judged worthy of the, of the financial support. So the jury thinks about your artistic ability with regards to the degree of training and experience. So they're not gonna be judging um, someone with a BFA and an MFA the same. They're gonna be judging, well, this person has a BFA and they're making work that um, is, is beyond someone who we think is um, that early in their um, artistic practice. The MFA, um, has not been showing anything in the last five years. Ah, they're not doing so well, um, judged by, uh, judged against others of the same experience. They look at your proposed program. They look at your financial need, as I said, the impact the grant will have on your practice, on um, bringing uh, your practice forward, making you better, challenging yourself. So with grant applications, absolutely do the research well ahead of time. Um, visit the AFA and the Canada Council websites, see what those deadlines are, start months in advance. They will always have a checklist provided so you can follow that checklist or see what they're asking for and make your own checklist. Be clear and brief in your project description. And again, as with other applications, include only the information and documentation required. Contact the granting agency to ask questions. Um, and as I said, there, there is someone there who is the person to ask questions of. And they are happy to answer questions because they do want to give, they want to give out this money and they want to help artists. and. Um, and help artists to put forward the best applications that they can. And request feedback if available. Uh, sometimes the feedback, you won't even necessarily know how it applies to you. Uh, they, can't, they can't directly provide feedback about your particular proposal, but there's usually someone um, with the jury who's taking notes and will compile those into something. Um, and so, the information generally will be helpful for, um, for applicants. In closing, yes, we're finally closing. Um, if anyone's been in Cub Scouts, you'll recognize this. Uh, Kayla, we'll dob, 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 dib, dib, dib.
do your best. Um, that's all, uh, that's all you can do is your best and put your best foot forward. And I suppose now, whew, end of slideshow. So now we can uh, have questions, I guess, if, if uh, the other panelists want to come back. This was really weird because I feel like I'm just practicing to myself here. I don't, I don't get any feedback of eyes rolling or groans or excellent thank you so much um i lost my screen <laughs> there momentarily way to go tech uh thank you michelle that was fantastic um we do have two questions rivers asked if we can have a copy of the slides and yes uh to let everyone know because we had quite a few folks tune in at various points uh we will be sending out the slides to all of the uh folks who registered for the session along with um, supplemental notes. And then we also um, are doing a recording and we will be sharing that out uh, with the registrants, um, hopefully tomorrow after Zoom compresses the information. Um, and so we do actually have a few questions in here. Um, and I'll just, Chanel has a question, so I will- Oh, not Chanel. <laughs> I will go and Chanel, I'm going to turn on your microphone if you'd like to ask your question. Chanel, are you there? Oh, Chanel's asking about file management. How do you keep yep. everything organized? Oh, Lord. I'm not a good example of, of a good file manager. Um, I at least try to keep things in, in folders. Uh, so a, a, a particular show or a proposal will be all in one folder. But in terms of um, images, I'm not a good example. I mean, I'm not a good example. <laughs> But organization is important. So do as I say, not as I do. Uh, and then we do have, um, Paul has asked, uh, yes, the, the recording and the slides will be available later. And then Eileen um, has a question. And for whatever reason, I'm, I apologize. I don't know if it's maybe on our end that the tech isn't working, but I'll just ask the question. Um, Eileen's question is, um, when talking of work not made yet in a granting situation, how do you write about that? Um, you want to relate it to past work so that the jury can, is, is the jury's gonna be looking at documentation of past work. So you wanna choose documentation and choose to write about the work that doesn't exist yet in a way that it can be tied back to what to what does exist and um i always i just try to imagine like i'm i'm the type of person who does not work well intuitively and so i like to picture what i'm going to make almost exactly and and that is what i describe and i try to relate it um To what already exists and you want to describe it how how big is it going to be what are the materials you're going to use um, you're basically picturing and describing to the jurors something that doesn't exist yet but will exist and it there may be a certain amount of not knowing what it's going to be finally which is fine um, the jurors don't expect you to have a fully formed picture of what it's finally going to look like but they want to know that you have enough of an idea um, enough of a process figured out that you can do what you are saying you want to do does that make sense that makes sense to me. Um, I hope that makes sense to Eileen. Um, <laughs> we do, uh, Nancy did say that she can provide some feedback on file management. Oh, uh, that would be awesome. Forte. So Nancy, I'm going to click, it says you're allowed to talk. And if you can turn on your microphone. 
it should be on. There you are. Fabulous. Sure, Nancy, would you like to provide some information about that? Try to have the fewest number one, have the fewest number of folders possible because it's really easy to bury multiple folders. If you have 10 or less folders would be easier. Try to date it by the year. Go with the year, then the month, then the date it is required to be submitted at the latest possible or have the first possible to send it in depending on when your grant it, you're trying to do it for. Mm -hmm. And then put a, as a little bit of information on what you are applying for so that you can find it easily. If you have a whole bunch of folders, if you have say 20 folders, you'll never find anything because you don't know where it is. And then you can file things back after the end of the year or after the end it was submitted, whether it was approved, rejected, and reason why. Then you can re go back to them and find the reason why, and then you're not reusing the same rejection. Oh. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. That's a really good yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that way at least you know why it was rejected. And then the approved ones, you know the reason why it was approved, and you can find it easily. So you can try to submit only like approved ones so that maybe you didn't submit everything in the checklist or it wasn't properly answered. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'll say too, if you are say writing an artist statement um, and you're doing multiple edits of it, make sure that you can differentiate and that you're not saving all of the edits and then you end up sending the one that wasn't quite finished as opposed to the one that is is completed um, and with documentation you want to always have a copy of your images that is saved at the highest resolution so the highest resolution that your camera can take and then um, when you're sending when you're compiling images to send with the um, uh, with the application, you will probably have to resize those. Um, they may say uh, a limit of one megabyte for all the attachments, in which case you'll have to resize. But if you always have that original um, largest file to go from, then if they want something that is highest resolution to print, then you've got something that you can, you can send to them. Um, and in that case, it's probably a good idea uh, to have separate folders, um, a folder for a particular show or a particular set of works where you have the, the master images, highest resolution, and then you have a folder of, uh, of formatted um, images ready to send out. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we have two questions from uh, Melanie. The first is, um, how do you become a juror for a grant application? What requirements do you need? Um, maybe we'll let you uh, answer the first one and then uh, she's got a second one to follow up. Uh, well, usually what happens is um, someone will be on a jury and when you are on a granting jury, at the end of the process, they ask you if you could recommend people to be on the jury. And so it's all a big networking thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think that's probably how I was asked is that someone recommended me. And then when I was on a jury, I recommended other people. Um, and you just, you, you have to be a practicing artist. And that's basically, that's basically it. Um, and the jury, there'll be other people on the jury uh, representing other disciplines or um, other areas. And then everyone together, theoretically, 
um, is able to have sort of a full picture and, and regardless of what medium the proposal is in, there will be someone there who, who understands it. So if someone doesn't understand performance, well, there's another juror who does understand mm -hmm. performance. So everyone's kind of represented. But yeah, basically it is someone's on a jury and they give your name to the, um, the funding body and then that's how, how you're contacted. And I know that uh, Canada Council, um, with the new portal that they have, uh, folks can apply to be on oh. juries as well through that. So if uh, there's anyone who's on today um, and you have been approved, uh, pre-approved to apply to Canada Council with their new portal, uh, it's in the same area that you would apply for grants where you can um, apply to be a juror as well. And that also, um, is a process where they evaluate um, your practice and are able to determine um, where you are at in, in your practice. Um, so if folks are interested in looking at that, and I've also heard that AFA granting is very much, as Marianne was talking about, it's about that networking piece. If you've been on um, a panel or I've even been asked in previous years where I've been successful with an application, um, they've asked me if I was interested in coming back as the next year on the juror. Unfortunately, I was with an organization that was applying annually to the yeah. AFA and that just wasn't um, a possibility. So I think, um, you know, expanding your network across the province and across the nation is uh, absolutely critical for that. Yeah. So Melanie's next question is if you are an emerging artist applying for exhibitions, grants, etc., and don't have a lot of experience putting up shows or receiving grant funding, how do you prove that you can pull it off? Are there specific grants for emerging artists? Um, there, there are grants to cover pretty much everything. Um, yeah, you, they will, depending what category you apply in, you are judged within that category. So um, as an emerging artist, and you haven't had, had a lot of shows, if you are making your own shows, like the, the Vanity Gallery or the do-it-yourself kind of stuff, that's a really good place to start. Um, if you are, uh, like there are lots of opportunities, uh, for example, the gallery at CASA has lots of group calls for submission, and Darcy is is really great and very inclusive and um, that might be might be a place to start in terms of starting out in group exhibitions and you really are um, even though you may not have had a lot of experience compared to other people you if you if you can photograph the work that you have completed and show it in the best light that's that's where to start. So everybody has to start somewhere and it really would just be a case of looking for those opportunities that are for emerging artists. And there are a lot of opportunities that are just for emerging artists. And so those of us who have, um, who have emerged fully, uh, we are not eligible for those kinds of opportunities. So just keep your eye, keep your eyes open and look for those emerging artists specific opportunities. Yeah, and Marianne, you're right, Darcy. Um, uh, we do have shows that are very specifically around emerging artists. And um, for those on the call, Darcy Logan is our gallery curator manager. So if you do have questions about any of the calls that he's putting out, um, his contact information will be always associated with that. And also as a member of the Allied Arts Council, um, you can always give any of us a phone call uh, if you do have questions about uh, how to apply um, specifically when it comes to his any of our opportunities or his opportunities. Um, Nancy's just putting into the chat to everybody. If anyone wants tips for file management, you can contact her directly. So if Nancy, if you wanted to share your contact info in the chat room, that would be great. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any other questions in the queue. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, give this as a final call to anyone for questions. We do have a little bit for wrap-up. Um, again, as I mentioned previously, we will send out the slides um, and the recording to those who registered. 
Apologies for those who might have received um, an incorrect start time of 7 p.m. Um, but we will send that out to everyone who is registered. So I'm not seeing any more questions pop up. Um, so I think at this point, um, if there isn't anything else, we'll just do all of our wrap up bits now. Um, so Marianne, thank you so much for that. That was a really fantastic welcome, session. Thank you. Um, you know, certainly um, I've, I've also learned a lot too. Visual art is not mine. Uh, I'm a classical artist, but I've written more than enough grant applications in, in my time for organizations and myself that it's always nice to pick up a few little tidbits here and there. Um, as I mentioned previously to folks, uh, we will be uh, sending out a short, short survey. Um, if you have any feedback, um, that would be great. We'll also be sending out a survey um, with um, options for additional professional development sessions. So um, I heard maybe there might be an opportunity in this one if, if folks are needing some help with photographing their artwork, if that's something that you'd be interested in, um, please let us know. Uh, we're also interested in knowing what day of work, uh, day of week works best for folks or what time of day, knowing that uh, we all might be home for quite some time or our lives still might be a little bit disrupted with COVID. Um, so if you have any suggestions for topics or if you have preference for a day and time, that would be great. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn over to um, Michelle for a few final words. So I'm going to uh, turn off um, Marianne's video at this time and turn on Michelle. Thanks, John. I'm just going to pop back to um, your slides here, Michelle. There we are. I think we should all see the ATB slide. Michelle, are you there still? Thanks, Don. Oh, are you frozen? Uh, no, I think we're good. Are you okay there? I'm not sure. I have a lot okay. of gaming that goes on in my house and online oh. university students. So okay. <laughs> add so a little bit there. of delay there. So I'm not sure if you said, hey, Michelle, let's pop yep. back to you, but I'm going to go with it. I just want to say a very special thank you to Marianne. I saw in the chat that Mike said, I love the digital, that we could do this online. And I think that's some of the feedback that the Allied Arts and ETV were looking to take away. So we're super excited. And uh, that survey that Donna's going to send out, we hope to get that feedback from all of you on what uh, delivery works best and timing. And you know, on behalf of the Allied Arts and the ATB Entrepreneur Center, we're really here to help support that journey. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to connect and share some of our advice with you. So have a really great night. And again, Marianne, that was incredible. I, I just can't believe all that goes into uh, getting funding. It's, that's incredible. So thank you all very much thank and have you. a really great night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. And I'll just do a final wrap up from the Allied Arts Council. So again, thank you so much to Marianne for uh, being here with us tonight. Thank you all for tuning in on uh, this Thursday evening. Um, with that, um, I'm just gonna do a little bit of a plug here for the Allied Arts Council. Again, we are a membership based organization. Um, if you are interested in learning more about membership, uh, we do ask uh, head over to our website, artslethbridge.org. Uh, an artist membership is only $25. Uh, you can reach out to Tara Galanders. She was on the call today, um, and you can talk to her about taking out a membership. Uh, from there, you would have access uh, to our member-only e-newsletter, which, as Marianne referenced, would have um, a list of any of the calls that come across our desk, our marketing and promotions manager does an extensive search um, and uh, shares that information with our members. Um, also, today's session is offered free um, and we are a nonprofit organization. If you like today's session and you'd like to make a donation, we would be um, happy to receive any kind of financial help at this time. And again, you can make that donation at artslethbridge.org. 
Um, and there will be a donate now uh, link. So I think with that, I'm just gonna check to see that we have, so we talked about the survey and donate membership. Uh, if anyone has any final or any additional questions um, following the session, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us at the Allied Arts Council and we can forward those questions on to Mary Ann. So I think with that, uh, thank you so much everyone for attending and have a lovely evening. I'm going to stop the screen share and end the webinar.